Yeah, um, so we basically work in like weather forecasting and climate modeling. And um, uh, I mean, traditionally we use floats for everything. And so uh, recently we've been thinking about uh, yeah, doing a lot of things in, in, in posits and uh, whether there's any potential for posits. Before I get started though, I might just say that, um, uh, yeah, so that's me. Um, so I've been working with Peter and, uh, and Tim about that. And uh, unfortunately we are not computer scientists, so, so we are physicists and really coming from the side of, uh, from, from, the, from the actual modeling itself, and then we realized, hey, if, if we really wanna go to, towards like exascale weather models and so on, we need to understand much more about the computer science. Um, so that's also why I'm here, right? So I'm really eager to learn a lot. I uh, hope to learn a lot from you about, um, but so maybe apologies if I, if I mix up some of the terminology or something is unclear, just uh, catch me afterwards in the tea break, because I might just use the, the way how, how I think about it in physics. Um, second thing, I might just like, uh, yeah, mix up the words weather and climate models. So from a computer science perspective for now on, you can just consider it to be the same. So this is, um, I mean, there are some, some differences, but at the moment, this is really just uh, completely interchangeable. So um, in order to get motivated, I thought I, um, I show you one plot to uh, nicely summarizes where we are currently in weather forecasting. Um, and this shows you here the forecast skill on the y-axis over the last decades um, of the, uh, the model that we use at the European Weather Center in the UK. And you can see, uh, see that this forecast skill basically ramped up more or less continuously over the last decades. So saying like our weather models got better and better and better. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, always your, your day three forecast is always better than your day five forecast, uh, than your day seven forecast and so on. And especially, especially these like medium range weather forecasts, they're really, really important. So if you think about a hurricane that's gonna arrive somewhere in the Caribbean, you really wanna tell them early in advance that this is gonna happen and inform them about this. Um, and I mean, these, these forecasts are not, not, not perfect, but they still, uh, yeah, increased over, over the last decades, and there's several reasons. So some of them are due to like availability of satellite data. So some of these ramp ups here around 2000, they were actually, um, because we were able to, to include much more information about the, from the satellites into our weather models. Um, but in general, this, this more or less linear increase here is actually due to better models. So like scientists so spending decades and decades on improving the algorithms. Um, but also um, because, yeah, thanks to Moore's law, supercomputers just got faster and faster. So we were just able to, yeah, basically use the same model, just increase the horizontal resolution, and bam, we had a better model. Um, and so we actually, in weather forecasting, we have a very strong link between uh, our model performance and the horizontal resolution. So in 2009, um, our models were like on the order of like 25 kilometers um, horizontal resolution, where nowadays we're kind of on the order of nine. And really the, the challenge for the next decades is that we would like to get down to something like a one kilometer, which we then call like a cloud resolving uh, weather model uh, or even climate model, which would be amazing, but it definitely requires something like exascale supercomputers and more on the order of like sustained performance and not just like peak performance. Because I mean, most of the weather models are actually, uh, in terms of the sustained performance, they're actually quite far away from whatever you get from a LINPAC benchmark or whatever. Um, um, yeah, and maybe here, these, so like the forecast skill is never perfect. And so where does these errors come from? Um, first of all, we have a lot of initial and boundary condition errors that might be your observations that are not perfect, the way how you assimilate your data in the model, but also in terms of like boundary conditions in terms of uh, climate change, we don't know what humans are gonna do. Um, secondly, there's also a lot of model error, right? So the equations of motion that we use are we use a lot of approximations in them. Um, so in terms of like our model, it's not the reality, it's a model of the reality. Uh, and so processes like clouds, precipitation, radiation, and there's uh, probably another hundred. Um, they are, we kind of use heuristic equations to somehow represent them. We could never actually resolve them. Um, so there's a lot of error coming in that one. Um, then we also have discretization error, right? So once we go from our continuous equations to towards like discrete equations. So we have a finite spatial and temporal resolution and that always includes some error. And then fourth point is yes, we have rounding errors, but uh, I mean, as traditionally we use double precision floats, we really have to see these ones as being huge 
whereas this one is really tiny. Um, and so if we somehow could exchange, uh, like make this rounding error a little bit bigger in exchange for more performance, that would be, uh, would be amazing because these errors down here, they're always gonna be dwarfed by the errors up here. Um, and so what we did then a couple of years ago, um, and this is, this is a paper of Philip Vanna and Peter Duben, where they just had taken the, the weather forecast model and because uh, I don't know whether nobody thought about this 10 years ago, but they've just replaced uh, basically all the double precision computation with single precision and uh, the forecast error basically remained the same, but at like, I don't know, 60% of the runtime or so. And suddenly we have a lot of more resources on the supercomputers available that could be uh, spent otherwise. Um, and so we're kind of at the state that we know single precision is doable and we kind of try to go towards 16-bit because 16-bit would be the next thing that is most likely to, be, to get some hardware support. Uh, but for us at the moment, it's really not clear whether um, this should be like half precision floats or some funny formats like the bfloat 16 or even posits. Um, and so I thought really about like, okay, let's, let, let's, let's have a bit closer look at that. Um, the way how we do it is really, um, so we are not hardware guys, we are like completely software guys. Um, so the way how we investigate um, what number format is, 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 uh, is good for us is really like, we basically just overload uh, like a, a plus function here with some, like the plus function plus some rounding. Um, that simply means that if, if you have like a single precision number like this one, we basically just chop off, set these ones to zero, do some rounding here in order to uh, basically emulate what would be the rounding error you had if you had this hardware available. And yes, it's slow, right? Because that includes a lot of overhead, but it gives us the, uh, gives us the possibility to test what these number formats would actually do without having specialized hardware. And so, uh, yeah, without waiting for, for all this hardware being available, hardware is much more uh, expensive than actually just writing a program that does that. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, in the last years, we basically have focused mostly on, on floats and reducing the number of significant bits here and to, to understand what is the actual bitwise information content that we, that we have to worry about and where, do we can, where can we actually chop off this noise that uh, Peter was talking about uh, this morning. Um, and so this is just like one, one study that uh, uh, Matt and my group has done um, a couple of years ago where um, this is a forecast of Hurricane Sandy. Um, Maybe you've, you've, you've known about like Hurricane Sandy, but that was 2012, and this hurricane basically moved here along the coast of the US, and then suddenly turned left and hit New Jersey quite uh, catastrophically. Um, and so you see basically the same computation now with double precision, so like 52 significant bits. The um, exponent bits didn't get changed here, so we just kept it simple. Uh, and then same in single precision, 23 uh, significant bits, and he even went down to something like eight significant bits. Um, however, we cheated a little bit, so we only included this, 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 uh, this, this rounding error in some of the linear terms within the spectral transform of the whole model. So this is really just a tiny part, but if you, if you look at these uh, weather forecasts, I mean, this is basically indistinguishable. And even this forecast here would have provided you the necessary information that this hurricane has turned left and we could have informed uh, the, the east coast of the United States that they really have to prepare. Um, and just to give you an overview, because this is really, I mean, we've been cheating here. This is, this is really just one part of the model. Um, and so eight significance bit are, are not, definitely not gonna be representative, but it kind of shows you in which way we're kind of heading to. And uh, so I, I picked up this, this graph here, which shows you a little bit um, the, the cost, like the, when, the, when the weather forecast model is running, in which parts of the, of, the, of the code is it actually spending time in. And so this is what we have right now, operational, what's currently running at the, um, at the European Weather Center. This is kind of our goals for the future. And so you see like the model is actually spending a lot of time in spectral transforms. There's uh, a lot of the like clouds, radiation, precipitation and so on. This is all happening in this bit here. But then there's also other things like the semi-implicit solver, which is this one. Then there's uh, grid point dynamics, which are basically the direction, whatever you transport from one grid cell to the other, is kind of happening in, in, in this bit here. And so a kind of, I mean, without really understanding the code, what happens in all of these, um, I mean, there, there's uh, basically hundreds of people working on, on, on all of this uh, stuff. Um, 
but basically the spectral transform, there's a Fourier transform involved, there's a Legendre transform involved, like this is basically a matrix matrix multiplication. There's a lot of MPI communication, um, which is because it's uh, spectral, it has to be global. Uh, if you go down to the, to the ocean model here, there's like finite difference algorithms, there's semi implicit solvers, interpolations, there's like a halo type of MPI communication. Uh, if you go to these elliptic solvers, to the semi implicit solvers here, there's like multi grid preconditioners. Uh, if you go to the grid point dynamics here, this is kind of a funny way of MPI communication where you don't know, you only know at runtime where you have to request data from. So, like which direction, because it depends on the direction of your, of your flow. Um, have some cubic interpolation and so on. And uh, um, so what we're dealing with is basically not a single algorithm, but a whole zoo of different algorithms. And it's, it's uh, uh, even in the future, we don't expect these zoo to, to get smaller. So there's always going to be many, many algorithms. And we basically have to understand all of them and to understand how, where we can actually reduce the precision. And uh, maybe this is also um, what, uh, what Peter was talking about, the SK this morning. So because at the moment we're using the spectral model, so we have global MPI communication. So within like 12 minutes of runtime, we actually have to communicate 427 terabytes among these 2,000, uh, almost 3,000 MPI processes. So there's also, um, yeah, like the potential that if we could reduce that, it removed quite a bottleneck uh, from, from the global, uh, from, from the model. Um, there's also other approaches like more, um, uh, like grid point models that don't use these spectral transforms that uh, transfer much less data. However, the runtime at the moment is still just not feasible. So if we want to get our weather forecast done within like a six hour uh, window, we have to do it as fast as possible because uh, there's a lot of uh, pre-processing, post-processing and so on to the data simulation and so on involved. So there's basically only a certain time frame that you have available. So you have to do whatever you can as fast as possible. Um, yeah. And then I think like one and a half years ago or so, so it was just at the beginning of my PhD, I came across this uh, YouTube video uh, by John, uh, and I was, quite, uh, I was quite fascinated here by this uh, Simpson plot. Uh, and so, yeah, from our perspective, it was really like, yeah, nice, there's another number format. Um, and, but I mean, the, the, the examples that he gave were more, more, more or less like uh, linear algebra and uh, these kind of things. And so for us, it was really the question like, are, is, are posits like a number format that could be much, much better suited for the, for the computations that we actually do. And so um, maybe the, 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 the way, so probably you guys have, you guys have seen uh, these, these, uh, these software emulators. This is the one that I've used in, uh, in Julia. It's very simple, right? So you just uh, define these, uh, these, this environment, then you can do arithmetic operations with it. You see that even if you, if you request the bits, it's actually doing it in posits, and you can convert things back. So basically, this is, this is everything uh, I've used, and uh, basically build the models that I, will that I will present you now in the next, uh, um, next few minutes. I've basically built that around, the, uh, around this emulator, um, which unfortunately is, is slow, but it gives, you, it gives us at least the answer where in which direction we could go to. Um, so the, the very, the most simple thing in weather forecasting, we, we always start with, it's, it's a toy model. Um, so that's the, the Lorenz 63 model, which is uh, actually only these three equations. So there's not even a discretization in space. There's only one in time. Um, but although this system actually has not that much to do with weather forecasting, um, it has one property that uh, also weather forecast models have, and it's, it's chaotic, right? So whatever tiny error you introduce in the beginning will always ramp up, and you have an exponential error growth. And so uh, even like a tiny rounding error at some point will give you a complete different answer. Um, and uh, if you solve this uh, with uh, yeah, double precision floats, you get this, this butterfly, right? So which uh, gave rise to the term of the, the butterfly effect, which is a... Um, if this is of fractal nature, so this is a, what we call like a strange attractor. So basically these trajectories here, they never cross. So in an, the analytic form of that, the trajectories would never cross, but they would always basically go over and under each other. And this is what makes it uh, um, a, a fractal. Um, if we now compute the whole thing and uh, really go down with the precision in something like 16-bit uh, floats, then you can see that the density clearly decreased. Uh, and this is basically because your rounding errors get so big that at some point, two trajectories that are close to each other just get, ra get round to one, and suddenly you have a, like a periodic solution. So um, I don't know whether any dynamical system guys here, but this basically means that uh, 
yeah, you have a parodic solution and you, you completely, you destroyed your fractal, right? So at some point, your solution will just repeat. Uh, but I mean, that also happens with, with uh, double precision floats, but uh, much, much later, right? With, and uh, we can actually do also try, I've, uh, I've kind of tweaked a little bit around here by like rescaling the system. So just like ramping up the numbers a little bit, making them a bit bigger. And uh, so if we use a scaling on the order of 100, we can actually also compute the system within 16-bit uh, integers. But uh, yeah, you see it's, it's even worse. And you, there's lots of funny things happening that basically in the middle it gets round to zero. And so you just converge down here to the, to the origin, which is completely uh, uh, not what we want to get. However, if we use uh, posits, and I was really surprised about that. Um, so again, we use a little bit of scaling. You will see in a second why I've picked this number. But you see that this one is much closer to that than this one is, right? So uh, I was actually quite surprised. And this is basically because there's so much more uh, precision on the orders of these numbers that are computed here that really gives, gives the benefit for, uh, for, for, for this kind of system. Um, and so you probably have seen these kind of graphs before from, uh, from, uh, from, from John. Uh, so this is, I call it here precision and not accuracy. This is just to, because in weather forecasting, we always call accuracy the accuracy of your forecast. So I kept this one as precision in order to, to keep the two things separate. Because we kind of, uh, we, like, I mean, our philosophy is basically increasing the accuracy by reducing the precision, right? So that's, uh, uh, and um, yeah, I've extended this a little bit. So I mean, this, the, the double precision floats here in black, and then different posit formats, and then the, basically the, the, the spikiness of your, of your pyramid is the, is the number of exponent bits. Uh, but you can also do the same thing for 16-bit integers and also uh, funny things like uh, uh, these fixed point formats. Uh, but they are all 16-bit. Um, and uh, I just went then and, and looked at the numbers that are actually occurring in this Lorentz system. Uh, and just basically on every single operation that somehow yeah, is subject to rounding errors, um, I've basically just counted all these numbers and put them into one histogram. And this is now here shown for different, different scalings. And so, for example, for the, for the one here the, yeah, where the scaling is just one, you can see that this is kind of the, uh, the histogram that you get. And, uh, and yeah, this, this already, already tells you that there's actually quite some numbers that are a bit in, like in this region here. So for posit, it would be beneficial to, to shift it down a little bit. And, uh, I mean, it sounds a bit as a, as a disadvantage that you have to scale things, but I would more or less formu I would more formulate it in a way that actually having posits, because your decimal precision is variable, you have the possibility, the advantage that you can rescale your system and then really profit from this from this from the spike here. Whereas uh, the rescaling is completely uh, it doesn't matter for floats, right? So whatever you whether you scale it up or scale it down, you basically get the same answer with floats. Um, um, and so, yeah, going back to the presentation from the, the last presentation from people at Lindstrom, actually, I found this quite funny because, uh, yeah, I've also th thought about, like, what would be the optimal decimal precision that we can have? So kind of thinking about, yeah, uh, I mean, using 16-bit, there's some constraint on the area under this curve with respect to, like, all these logarithms here. But there's, like, the area is basically constrained whenever you want to have a number system that's a bit wider, that uh, then you have to sacrifice something in the middle, right? Um, and so we, we kind of, yeah, we, I mean, floats is probably not the, the, the shape that we optimally want to have here, but I would claim that posits, it's much closer to what we want to have here than, 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 than floats are. And uh, I would find it really interesting if you actually could just like basically have a number format that you basically just draw here, uh, and then bam, you have a number system, and these are the numbers you can use in your, uh, in your simulations. Um, but so sometimes I just think about reduced precision modeling as um, like basically two sides of a coin. One is you try to rescale your equations to fit a given number system. So basically like pushing this one around so that it fits nicely with these ones or to find a number system that fits the numbers that you have. Um, and so this, this is basically, uh, I mean, the, this, this second one is definitely a here. Posits are probably a good number systems for that. But on our side, we also have to do, like we have to think about how we scale our algorithms to actually uh, profit as best as possible from, from these formats. Um, 
However, Lorentz is really a toy model, and so in order to make this whole thing a bit more realistic, we went to something that is called the shallow water equations. Um, this is basically a, like a 2D version of the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, a bit more simple, but uh, we re now we're really doing fluid dynamics here. Uh, so you have like advection terms, because we're on the sphere, we have also Coriolis terms, you have um, some pressure gradients here. Um, this is basically a funny version of a, like, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a biharmonic operator here, but it's basically the, the Laplace operator that occurs in the, in the Navier-Stokes equations, and then some, some additional uh, um, uh, terms that I don't want to go into detail, but if, if you're interested, ask me later. Um, and so these equations are really derived from first principles, right? So like conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, and then also I've included this, this equation here which is, is like a conservation of a tracer, and a tracer really think about it as like temperature, but also humidity in the atmosphere or salinity in the ocean. Um, and although these equations are similar to the Navier-Stokes equations, they're not exactly the same. They have uh, quite some uh, simplifications in them. But I've used, in order to discretize them, I've used some features that are also used in uh, state-of-the-art ocean and atmosphere models. So basically, the, the algorithms that are used are actually not that different from uh, what you have in the big models. Um, so in under to understand these, these equations a bit more, is um, I basically discretize them over a rectangular box that is like 500 meter deep. And because in, in like geophysical uh, simulations, we always think about this of being on the order of like a, a few thousand kilometers. So that's where this, this term shallow came from because I mean, usually we look at a layer that is incredibly thin compared to the horizontal scales. Um, and so to, to really show you what, how actually simple that is, um, we only have a velocity in, in, in two directions. We have like a, a surface height um, in, terms of an, of, in terms of the ocean, that's basically uh, your surface height. In terms of the atmosphere, you can interpret this as pressure. And then you have a tracer, for example, temperature. And I simply drive this model here by uh, using a forcing here that kind of, I mean, if you think about an ocean, it, it kind of pushes your water masses across. Um, so what we, yeah, really think of this as like a, a 2D layer version of the, of the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, However, in order to make these equations here suitable for 16-bit arithmetics, there was actually quite a lot of things we had to do. And uh, just to give you a, a little idea, because this is physics, we kind of, we have an idea what these terms mean and uh, which uh, order of magnitude we have to expect here. And because here our grid spacing is on the order of, of like 10 kilometers, we know that this term here, for example, is actually quite small, whereas this one is usually quite big. So in, for like 16-bit arithmetics, ouch. Right? So you have to be really careful that you avoid these numbers because otherwise you get overflow, underflow, or like even with posits, I mean, you get into the range where you really have uh, big rounding errors. And so for us, this really means that uh, whenever we write down these algorithms, we have to think about how we can rescale them to avoid these numbers. Um, yeah. um, and uh, so, yeah, if, if you do some, some funny things like moving some, some constants around here, then you can, uh, you can actually see that, uh, yeah, we can actually make these equations possible for 16-bit arithmetics. Um, and then, yeah, this is basically what I want to show you now, is this simulation, which is completely computed in 16-bit pothers with two exponent bits. Um, and I'll just press play now. Uh, and, yeah, this already looks much more like an ocean. Um, and... Uh, I will show you in a second the, the comparison. So I could show you this, the same video now for also for double precision, for half precision um, uh, floats. But uh, I thought I'd just keep it simple. Um, and I think what you see here now is probably something like the first 16-bit ocean atmosphere model. So I mean, from our perspective, that was never people thought about doing because it was not uh, um, yeah, feasible of doing it in hardware. And uh, so I just thought I, I look at it some like snapshots. So uh, this would be double precision float, which I just consider here to be the truth. And then this would be with 16-bit uh, posits. And you can see these are really, really similar. Um, if you compare this to half precision floats, you can see like, I mean, this looks more like this than this one does, right? And uh, I th found this, this, uh, this satellite picture from somewhere in the Black Sea, somewhere down here is Turkey. And you can see that these, these basically these little worlds and the filaments, so we're actually doing something that is uh, not that far from reality. Um, so these simulations are actually quite close to what you have in, for example, here, the real ocean. Um, but however, this is a, uh, I mean, it's just like looking, looking by eye, judging by eye, right? So we tried to make it a bit more, um, a bit more solid. 
uh, by doing like uh, 200, 280 forecasts, and every time we, we start from like a like a random uh, initial conditions, and we do every forecast with like a uh, yeah float 64 and also the other number formats. And I've done something down here to get an or an idea of the discretization error that. Uh, yeah, we basically use the, the full precision, but includes some, some discretization error. So it went down from like a wrong could to fourth order to third order and so on. Uh, but basically the arithmetics are always the same. And so by like averaging them, we then get an idea of what the forecast error is. So the discretization error would basically be somewhere here. I uh, normalized that so this would be down here would be a perfect forecast. Up there would be basically a useless forecast. And so everything down here is where we are in this, in this regime of uh, acceptable errors. So the errors would be completely dwarfed by whatever other errors we have. And everything up here would be uh, not so good. So float is basically up there. If you do the same with, posit with one exponent bit, you're down here. With two exponent bits, it's actually pretty, pretty good. Um, however, we have to be really careful with the dynamic range. So if you do something like zero exponent bits, it just uh, ramps up because the dynamic range is much too small. Um, so probably clearly outperform floats. Um, and uh, so if you compare this again, and I've computed a couple of, of terms here now that happen in, that are computed in the model, you can see that it's actually quite, quite beneficial because some of these terms are quite small. So uh, it is really beneficial to go some, to like a slightly wider dynamic range for uh, our, um, um, for our t case here, but I think this could be probably generalized to something like a yeah, more general computation of fluid dynamics or PDE uh, type problem. Um, um, we skip that. And so to, to read, to summarize, I mean, what we're currently using are CPUs that have like uh, double precision, single precision, and some integers. And uh, what we actually want to, want to have based on this, on this study here would be amazing if we had like a CPU based on like a posit numerical unit that has something like single precision posits in order to match these, but then also half precision posits uh, because I think there's actually quite a big, uh, yeah, a lot of workload that could be done in half precision posits. Um, and so, I mean, our road, roadway is kind of, kind of this one here. Uh, and it would be amazing if we then could basically yeah, switch down to posits. Um, yeah, um, if you find this interesting, uh, if you have any other questions, drop me an email. You can follow me on Twitter. There's also the, the, the videos also on Twitter. Uh, and the model that I've, I'm writing is also on GitHub. So you can, uh, if you, if you want to use that or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, get an idea of what I have actually done. Yeah, just get in touch. Thank you. <laughs>